Want to know more about rock, jazz, rhythm, and blues? You got to start from the bottom up. The Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show with David C. Gross and Tom Semioli. Two bass road warriors tell tales, interview the greats, and spin more great music than you can shake a chap and stick at. The Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show with your hosts, David C. Gross and Tom Semioli, every Monday at 8 on Cygnus Radio. Hi, this is David Gross, and welcome to another edition of the Bass Guitar Channel Radio Show on CygnusRadio.com. Along with my co-host and head honcho for Know Your Bass player, Tom Semioli, tonight we have the pleasure of having on our show the great Harvey Brooks. Harvey Brooks has performed or recorded with everyone from Bob Dylan to Miles Davis, Mike Bloomfield, Stephen Stills, The Electric Flag, and on and on. Well, let's get started. Hi, Tom. Hello, Harvey Brooks. How you doing, Harvey? How are things? I'm doing great. Uh, things are good. And Harvey's got a bass on his lap. Okay, I'll put this over here. <laughs> That's the trusty P bass, I presume. Yeah. Here you go. See that, David? People still play Fender basses, David. I hope so. <laughs> and look, that one has four strings on it, David. Even. That I can't count. He can't count the... Right. I go one, two, three, five, six. Well, I remember my first run-in with uh, six-string basses uh, with Jack Bruce. You know, as an amateur guitar player as well, I thought that the sound was great. And it was really a cool thing, but, you know, that was like what a guitar player would do. But Jack played it really intelligently. And now in this current lifetime, what bass players are doing is like it's another planet for me. And what's interesting to me about the Fender 6 is there's really very little way that you can play that instrument without a pick. Because right. the strings are so close together. Together, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I'll show you. <laughs> Here goes David with his six-string bass. All right. Look at that. With the pink strings, no less. Ooh. But as you see, the um, the string spacing is a jazz-based spacing. That's cool. Yeah, it really is. And oddly enough, it's only nine and a half pounds, so it's actually lighter than some of the old 60s P basses. <laughs> well, you got to do exercises to play that. Uh... <laughs> exactly. So, Harvey, I have a couple of questions for you. Did you ever work with Paul Lecca? Oh, uh, I, uh, I recognize the name, but I don't think so. Uh, oh, because my sister was writing songs with him for like real pop acts, like um, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Peppermint Rainbow. Uh, her name was Denise Gross. I was wondering if you ever ran across her. Uh, no. Okay. No, I know the, the ilk. It's yeah. Right, it was in Broadway, New York. Well, it's funny because when I read your book, I grew up on 68th and Broadway. As a matter of fact, Don Lamont, uh, Rick Murata, uh, right. Terry Knight, Sidney right. Poitier, they all lived in the building. It was, you know, 68th and Broadway, pretty midtown. Yes. And every club you talked about, it just brought back such memories. I, I saw the Blues Project at Cafe Agogo. I saw uh, Soft Machine, McLaughlin, uh, In a Mountain Flame, the first record. They did a show at um, Cafe uh, Agogo and, and all those places. And I, I played a lot of those places myself. So it really was a great walk down memory lane. Well, you know, the thing about that is it's a, it's a world encapsulated now in a book. Or, you know, in stories we pass on because it doesn't exist. Not so much that it's later in time or anything. It's just a concept. There's no room for it. What we did is we hung and we played and we jammed. We played six nights a week. We did all this stuff that's not available anymore. I don't mean COVID. I don't mean COVID. I mean prior to COVID. Right, right. You want six night a week gigs playing Wilson Pickett tunes or, uh, you know, so all that all that kind of uh, training and playing field, to my knowledge, doesn't really exist that much. And it's, it's kind of like why the music has kind of taken the direction it's taken, which is more insulated. Right, people don't, right, people don't play together as much. That's one of the things Marcus Miller was saying is, my students can play with YouTube, but they can't play with each other. And, you know, you talk about those days, uh, which you uh, do so brilliantly in the view from the bottom. My apprenticeship was what was known as Top 40 Band. And right. the Top 40 Band, right, which was essentially the same thing. You played R&B and you played blues and you played a jazz tune and you played, you know, a dinner set and a dance set. That's it. The best, uh, uh, the best apprenticeship right. you can have. But, uh, hey, let's go backwards, David uh, and Harvey. Let's start with Elegant Geezer. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where did you get that name? Is that Are you referring to David and myself? No. Well, I'm, I'm sure uh, in a few years you might fit. Uh, <laughs> I think we fit now. <laughs> yeah. yeah it came, well, actually, it came from a friend of ours 
a great guitar maker named uh, Chris Larson. Okay. Uh, he has uh, girl guitars. If you ever seen them online? Mm-hmm. And he's a great guitar player as well. But we like sitting around just laughing about stuff. And he just said, he said, yeah, this like elegant pieces, you know. And that's about <laughs> maybe 10 years ago. And it okay. just was floated around. And when it came to do this, started doing the recording. And, and my wife, Bonnie, said, uh, you should call it elegant. We're looking for a name. You know, I don't know what to call it. It's like, you know, music. You're now an elegant geezer. You know, you're a geezer, but you have a little bit of class, you know. <laughs> and things that are eloquent, you know, you, you kind of look for special things. or Right. So we, we say, well, since we were doing this music kind of like human being, it makes it kind of special. So Eloquent uh, Geezer and Elegant Geezer Record. Well, it's interesting. I mean, gosh, you know, as a session player, producer, band member, you played, you've done so much. You've had everything but be the guy whose name is on the spine of the record. <laughs> you know, so... It's the only thing left. What else could I do? What else could you do? Exactly. What inspired you to make a record? I, I mean, to my ears, it's interesting. It harkens back to a lot of your former band leaders, Bob, uh, Richie Havens, Fred Neal, uh, John Sebastian. It's a very homespun, folksy, intimate record. What uh, What inspired this record? Uh, just wanting to do it. You know, wanting to do it. And wanting to do it in Israel. And it also got inspired by, I found some guys to play with in a process. You know, it started with meeting the drummer. You know, we were going out to rent an apartment. And he had an, another apartment on the other side that he owned that he had up for rent. So we went over there and talked to him. And, oh, you're a drummer? Oh, that's cool. You know, he had a little rehearsal spot we kicked around a little bit and they said well there's a guitar player i had met maybe 10 years prior steve peskoff who was a great guitar player and so we called him up and, and so this thing organic and then we, we started to play a few gigs and uh, the guy who did sound yehuda arshish he not only was a good sound guy he came up and played some bass and then i switched over to guitar and right. it just like organically developed into this thing and then I said, well, I'm going for it. I mean, that was it. You know, you know and, and my wife said, if you're going to do it, be you. Whatever, you, whatever this is, you know, and, and it really started with her because Bonnie said, uh, well, look, you know, we were looking to maybe put something on Facebook. So she said, take a big guitar and, and, and play something and sing something and uh, let's see what happens. And it was that first song, What Goes On. What Goes right. On, right. Which has a great groove. And the recording yeah. is really well done. Yeah, well, uh, Yehuda is a, is a master. It's, his, it's in his little studio in his house, you know, and we just go there and he just knows what things are supposed to sound like. You know, and we passed it around a lot. There were no, I mean, it was my album, but, you know, and, and I sort of had the last say, but everybody, you know, contributed real, you know, for real, it made it happen. And I'm kind of used to, in, in my world of record making, you, you go to make it sound real simple. You make it sound real simple, like it was effortless, you know, it, it's going to groove, face, you know, and again, my wife came in, she's, co-producing as well she said i don't want to hear all this stuff leave space you know stand you know be there and and so it happened and the songs just kind of evolved you know they're like some are things i've seen some are i've experienced the instrumentals are are stuff that i've been playing for years that's kind of what is very so so bonnie was the objective ear the voice of reason uh as a producer yeah well you know i came back and i got to play it for her she would tell me you know she also helped me write the tunes you know she in no uncertain terms the process over and over again got it to the point we could finally say okay we're done that was it. The arrangements were basically the, the drummer, myself, and uh, Yehuda. And, you know, we'd sit and we'd just knock them around for the music. It's interesting, David and I, one of the things we always talk about is uh, the album as an art form. And just listening to these songs, the, uh, oh, there's What Goes On, there's Wrong, uh, there's Bonnie's Tune, what else? The Plum, I'm trying to remember, uh, Free Man, No Regrets. I mean, it fits together as as a solid piece, not just individual songs. And nowadays we live in the age of streaming and playlists do you think having made this record that the album format still has a place it's still relevant in the 21st century i figured this way either i do it or i don't i certainly cannot compete at 76 years old with my musical tastes as they are compete with what number one is that's not my world and it's stuff that all the music that they're playing is things that you know i played 50 60 years ago i mean these grooves are not new. They're just fatter and yeah. louder. It's not that they're new. It's just that you're, they're less thinking. But, you know, some of it is really well-written and well-done. 
I can only be where I am. And so rather than try to be something I'm not and taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, make this record and to express myself in this context as uh, the front guy, God bless. Exactly. And for the opportunity and for wonderful people. And there's a guy named Ehud Benai here in, in uh, Israel and Danny Sanderson. These are like established Israeli pop stars. And uh, both of them led some of their own uh, stuff like Ehud on what goes on in plays of the guitar parts, which mm-hmm. are really interesting. And uh, he's a great singer and a great songwriter. He's written, you know, if you, ever, you have a chance, check out Ehud Benai and Danny Sam. They're really good. Now, I'm curious, has COVID been difficult in Israel or have they been able? I mean, obviously, you're able to, to play live and, and stuff. Is it a little more relaxed or no? Uh, no, no. It, we, we've been up. Uh, they, we, we just opened up in terms mm-hmm. of taking the masks off. Okay. But I mean, up until uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were locked in. For, I mean, literally locked in. 100 meters in any direction, and that was it. Israel's been very serious about it, but also it's a small country. So we've been able to inoculate. There is like the uh, the Haredi and the, the Arab populations. Uh, there are some superstitious kind of things that has taken them a while to be comfortable with it. And uh, but I think overall, Israel's done really well. We're, we're just now opening up, saying we just hope that the herd philosophy works They're opening up to tourists now and i think we're kind of in, in the front of it well that's uh, great that's great good to hear i'm looking at your heartbeat system did you have to do any um changes because of the voltage i got the amp here oh okay so it was set Larry Harkey set me up over here yeah yeah yeah, yeah i have um the new head the um uh, it's really small it's about what is it the 8500 and a couple of 12s I always loved Hardkey's sound. I've tried so many different companies, but I'll always go back to a Hardkey or an or an SVT, one or the other. If someone's lifting it, it'll be an SVT. If I'm lifting it, it'll be a Hardkey. Yeah, I, I just think back, you know, some of my setups when I yeah. played with some of the bands, the Rhinestones, it was two SVTs with 18-inch uh, Sherwin Vega. Oh, gosh, I had one, yeah. You know, and so what do I know? I'm standing in front of it. It's blowing by me. It's just killing the people out front there. <laughs> I'm a but give me more. Put put more in the uh, with Fender. It was uh, dual showmans and uh, and even like this now. This is a lot. The uh, amplification and uh, the quality of PA's of what you can do now is just uh, yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. Yeah, yeah. Always the yeah, the L1000, LH1000. Always yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is heavy. A lot of times they end up taking a, a little uh, Galen Kruger, small Galen Kruger. Oh, oh sure. yeah, yeah. Well, believe it or not, this um, heart key is eight pounds, ah. 800 watts. Eight pounds, 800 watts, man. Imagine carrying that up to a five-floor walk-up, man. That's, oh. that's heavy, eight oh. pounds. <laughs> I think I'll have to talk to Larry about that. Yeah, actually, um, you could have a, it's got a handle on it. You could have one of my dogs carrying it up the stairs for me. <laughs> so I've got a story for you I, I want to talk about. It's 1969. I'm still in high school, and I'm working at, this clothing store, a hippie boutique on 75th and Broadway called Pandemonium. So the manager one night hands me two records and says, you have to go home and you have to listen to this. One of the records was Eddie Harris, a Les McCann um, Swiss movement, and the other was Bitches Brew. Put on Bitches Brew, I'm listening to the thing, and all of a sudden Spanish Key comes on. That defines my bass playing because that was so on the one just a fabulous a major inspiration for me me I, I never listened to the album that much you know and i always thought that it was such a, a momentous musical thing my job on that session was to play bottom miles first thing he said when when miles hired me because he wanted me he wanted somebody to, to be down there and hold it down. And uh, Tio sent me down to a session that he was doing with Betty, his wife at the time. And so that got, you know, kind of brought me in and Miles hired me from that session. And uh, all of these tunes, I don't remember. How does that go? That's boom, ba-da-dum, ba-dum, 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 ba-da-da-da-da-da-da. Oh, yeah. That was it. I mean, changed my life, Harvey. Changed my life. Well, talk uh, about, uh, Harvey, talk about working with Dave Hall, because you mentioned in your book that you, you actually studied with him. Um, yes. But, ha- yeah, ha- w- w- 
talk about the synergy and just working with Dave and how he, you guys combined electric and, and upright. Well, the, the thing about it, because Dave is a master, sure. he's a master of the instrument. Now, my definition uh, of the master of the instrument is he has a direct connection from what he's hearing to his ability to play. There's no in-between. There's no right. strings. There's no instrument, really. You know, it's that connection. And me, I'm basically holding on for dear life, you know, as yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's going on and find the right thing to do. You know, and the combination of that is because his sensitivities, you know, he would, he would, he would hear, he was playing this. And the only place I could go was where I was supposed to be was over here and hold that down so he could do that. Does it so well. And so we are personally comfortable. I wasn't pushing him. He wasn't pushing me out of the way. We were there together. And it changed my whole concept of music and kind of put me up a bunch of notches. I didn't have the nerve to really go on the road with Miles at that time right. because I didn't feel I was the master that they were. And uh, a big mistake. You know, I never did, do did Miles want you and Dave to go on the road together? I think that might have been what it was. When they talked to me, I was producing at the time and I had right. a session in, in California with John Hall. Right. You know, which I should have, you know, which I could have said, well, I'll move that out of the way to do the most amazing thing. But I did. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because at that time, I mean, that was pretty revolutionary for Miles to bring the electric bass into into a jazz platform because it was not, as David will recall, considered a legitimate instrument. So that was kind of a bold move. And I'm sure the jazz police were very upset that there was an electric bass. On a oh, Miles like, Davis record. But his wife, Betty, hooked him up with uh, Hendrix and people like that. And that kind of like opened his head up to that. So when Tio said to me, uh, Javi, Miles is doing a demo. Do you want to go down and play some bass for him? And he mm-hmm. wants to try electric. Really? <laughs> so I'll be there. And so, that, you know, that was it. I went down. We, we sparred around a little bit. And after the uh, session, you know, he invited me on to the to the album. So I've had these opportunities. I've been there in the beginning of a lot of things. People have taken it further. Somehow I ended up being there. And I was uh, very happy for the opportunity and be able to take advantage of it, contribute in a positive way. You know, and if I could inspire somebody else, as I've been inspired by so many, you know, just to be in that line of inspirers, you know, is a privilege. Yeah. You know, you were the first, like, I would say legitimate, not legitimate, or, you know, bona fide electric basis to play with Miles, because he, I think in, uh, on, the, on uh, Miles in the Sky, I think Ron... Carter played electric on maybe one or two tunes, and then uh, Philly de Kilimanjaro, he, he did. But, of course, Ron, not an electric. You were the first real electric player to get in the pocket with, with uh, Miles. You know, it was funny, you know, in, in sitting, I, I did, I think, Great Expectations, I think, with Ron Carter. Yeah, yeah, we're interviewing him, I think, Friday. Now, he's like an idol. Standing next to him, and I'm feeling like an electric bass player next to Ron Carter. So it was kind of weird for me, in, uh, in, in a way, but I did my thing. He acknowledged me, but didn't talk much, but he acknowledged me. So, uh, Ron, uh, you're all right in my book. That was Great Expectations by the Miles Davis Band, featuring Harvey Brooks on bass. Let's get back to our conversation. Well, I guess a lot of upright players probably felt intimidated by the electric bass because music was changing. Soul, rhythm, and blues now were coming to the forefront. And really, uh, Quincy Jones even said it in one of his interviews that aside from recording technology, the development of the electric bass was probably one of the most profound developments in 20th century music. Yeah, well, because, you know, the bass plays such an important role in the music in such a subtle way, you know, it controls the harmony, controls the rhythm, controls the spaces. When it was just playing percussion, for it was amplified to the point where it could make its statement clear. But up until that time, you really didn't, couldn't hear that. Once those notes, those bottom notes started to happen and the harmonics started to happen, and all of a sudden, those spaces, it was important for those bass notes to be just right and time-wise mathematically correct and then you know as of course everything else as the electric bass developed it kind of lost its character and now it's kind of like in that same place as any other instrument or book or device right it's been improved and improved and improved and there's been so many ways to learn quicker and quicker and master it and master it and to the point where it's again you know you kind of lose the essence I guess another thing of, you know, uh, the idea of doing an album, uh, you know, more of the, of the basic feelings is for that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bringing it all you back. Think home. about with with the quote unquote shops mongers and how trade show shops chops right <laughs> yeah or, you know but you can't swing for me i think as a young base is coming up right along the same time that the jockos and the stanley clarks your mind is going i gotta be the fastest bass player i gotta do this i gotta do that but as you grow older and as you either lose gigs because of that busyness right. or are told, play that at home, play the groove, you begin to understand and, and you see so much more how important the basics really are. In this mind, what's going on now, you have so many synth bass players who are keyboard players with yeah. very, very fast left hands. You just want to take a, a meat cleaver and go, nope, no nope. meat cleaver. Let me do my job, not to be confused with beaver cleaver. Okay. <laughs> That's the, well, you know, it's interesting, Harvey. Um, going back to the beat, uh, we spoke with your British counterpart, Mo Foster, who I, I'm sure you uh, know in the UK. Uh, Mo did uh, thousands of sessions. He, um, back in 1965, went around the time you started, the electric bass, people didn't know what to do with it. Mo tells us a story where he played with the London Symphony Orchestra before he knew how to read music. And the orchestra conductor just let him do you know, play freely because he did not know what the instrument did. Take us back when you were playing. I mean, obviously you had Duck and, and Jamerson were your peers and things. What was your approach? Because there was really no role models that came before you. Well, I, my approach really came out of uh, Atlantic Records. Okay. You know, in, in Atlantic Records. And, I mean, the, the first gigs I started, I remember playing, we played two types of things. Things where the front man's name was Joey Villa or something like that all the time. And we played sort of like a uh, trumpet player. What's his name? Oh, Louis my Prima. It was Louis Prima. Now, I played countless Louis Prima type gigs. Yeah, and I'd play up in the Boar Circuit, and I play uh, around town, and it was that, or it was Wilson Pickett. My first tour was with the Exciters, you know, which is all in the book. That stuff, and, and I was playing in every funky R and B place there was, on, you know, uh, up up and down the East Coast when I was like. 18 and 19 and 20. And then I started playing, you know, in Manhattan, in the Greenwich Village and all those little bars. And it was R&B was my foundation. When I got the, the folk music thing was with Bob Dylan, Al Cooper got me the gig. And then all of a sudden I was a folk rock bass player, me and Felix Papalardi. Felix was amazing. You know, that was my in. And so I just started playing around town down there, playing with Richie Havens and, and becoming spontaneous. I'd be the house bass player. I'd be sitting, uh, uh, I'd be there and, and Richie needed some Somebody to play bass, I was there. Uh, Eric Anderson or wh wh whoever it was. And, and then I got gigs from that. Uh, Arthur Gorson managed a bunch of these people. And then I got gigs from him. And so th that continuum started. And then simultaneously, uh, Bloomfield talked, since I met him on the Dylan sessions, right. talked to me and we got on to the electric flag right. concept. Again, this is like opportunities, being able to take advantage of them. And uh, one opportunity leading to another opportunity. And then Buddy Miles at Murray the Cage show. Right. You stole the drummer. You stole, uh... stole the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then went out to California. And, and in California, the influences were Coltrane, James Brown, Otis Redding. That was the thought behind the feel of the electric flag band. And again, so there I'm playing Duck Dunn, all the great New York bass players uh, at that time. Chuck Rainey, yeah. Chuck Rainey. Jerry Jamal. Jerry Jamont. You know, Jerry Jamont was with uh, King Curtis. Yeah. Right. Oh, huge influence on Jocko. Yeah. Was that? A huge influence on Jocko. He, he plays homage to Jerry Jamont. Yeah. Jocko started uh, with uh, CC. CC uh, Wayne Cochran. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. And so, like, I, I uh, when I first met Jocko, Jocko did one of those things to me. He said, oh, man, he said, you know, you're one of my real influences. <laughs> when I played with uh, Wayne Cochran, you know, and I used to listen to you. I never fully put that together because time wise, but right. I'm not going to argue with Jocko. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just amazing, uh, amazing bass player. But, you know, like he actually laid it out. He was the first one to really lay, lay it out as a, a dynamic instrument that can do everything and not really be overdone. He stayed musical and uh, harmonically uh, incredible. You're so right. And, and what's interesting is I wish more people knew that, you know, besides being an amazing bass player, what he really was, he was an incredible composer. Yeah. And so many of his songs, and, and you, could, you could hear 
his composing and his bass lines. It, 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 you know, I think Charles Mingus is very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, Charles Mingus is the icon. Yeah. I read his book. Uh, Beneath uh, the Underdog? The Underdog. Yeah. You know, and he took no prisoners. But like, you know, talk about the struggle to play and make music. I mean, it's uh, just the songs, you know, just he, he was able to take on the politics of it and not be questioned. Exactly. You know? to be affirmative and powerful. Yeah, I remember in the book you were talking about fables, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are fun, yeah. I mean, you know, I have like four or five different versions of that, you know, and every one of them. Is, uh, I, I just love the, the album where he's like making believe he's in a club and he's playing all these tunes and uh, just uh, inspiring. He too, like Jocko, was a hell of a piano player. As a matter of fact, there's a great Mingus plays piano. I think it's on Impulse. Just a fabulous record of um, incredible improvisations and such. He, he did some of that on Columbia also. This is the Bass Guitar Channel radio show on Cygnus Radio. Dot com. It's hard to believe Mitch Miller was a producer there during that time. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like they had three or four guys like that, but they were like music business guys. But Mitch Miller, so I think he had some someone he had some dirt on or something, you know, to have, to have been in there that long doing that with some other talent around. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to think of him as a producer. You just think of him as, and a one, and a two. <laughs> now, he launched more could have been dance partners, you know. <laughs> yeah. I have to say that the thing uh, in, in writing the book and going through, it's like a, a very strange experience. As it is, you know, memory comes in and comes out. Right, sure, everybody. Uh, yeah. But in doing that, uh, Frank Beecham, is, he's a musical historian, he, who, you know, really helped on the book. Between him and Bonnie, we were like bouncing all the stuff around. To go through that in your life, you know, to have experienced a lot of things. I mean, that's not, I'm not unique, obviously. Right. But in, in, in terms of trying to talk about it and put it down on paper and bring out those things and, try, and remembering uh, the details and, you know, what you, say, you said and what you should have said and what you didn't say what you did and what you shouldn't have done and what you should have done. Uh, it's pretty much an incredible process. And this became more or less a life story. And also with my wife making a life, uh, a purposeful life, you know, and, and what it took for me uh, to get to that place and to stay alive. You know, it's such a great I'm... history lesson, that book. Tom and I always talk about the music business was still so young no one knew what they were doing, so everyone was just doing what they thought was right. Yes, uh, absolutely. And That's... ultimately, it became the right thing. Now, now you got all these bean counters thinking, ah, we know how to do this, we know how to do that. And it's just not. In its own way, the punk movement in the 70s was a way to get back to independent record companies and such. I mean, now you have independent record companies because of streaming. It's a different thing. But I, I think at the beginning of our conversation, you're right. It'll never be that again. No, it's just not It's not set up for that. The only way, the, I think the thing that will happen is young entrepreneurs or entertainment facilities will be created and musicians will be playing mostly not for money right but will be playing for the music because they can't afford pay for the music you know and the venues that can will be bigger although we don't know what it's going to be like with viruses and stuff like that you know people have to put out a lot of money to create venues sure. so, liability I mean, yeah nobody really knows what it's going to be so you know and the people who have a grip on making money. From what I understand, it's not a lot of money to be made in streaming. You know, the more your music is played, the less money is available, is what I've been told. You know, you sell an album now on uh, iTunes and it's seven ninety nine. dollars Yeah, I, I have no idea. So for the love of the music really becomes more and more urgent. And I think those are going to be the survivors. I think back to my youth, I was not going to take a job. I was going to play the bass. I was going to make it somehow, whether it meant eating bagels at H&H &H Bagels three times a day or, or what have you. Fortunately, there was studio work. There were demos to be made. Different but, world, yeah. 
a right. totally different world. If musicians, quote unquote, like me, end up taking jobs to survive, right. their playing is going to suffer immeasurably. What could happen in two years could end up taking six or eight. So it really, and there comes the sampling again. Well, I don't have to learn to play an instrument. I just need to cut this four bar phrase. Well, that's, that's, of course, that's the debate we have with the, you know, the difference between analog and digital recording with analog uh, you had to master your instrument because you didn't want to wear out the tape. And now right. with digital recording, of course, it's changed the art form of the bass in the sense because now you don't have to nail the track. You can just pretty much cut and paste. And you find now that a lot of musicians, when we interview them, at least when I do with the younger ones, a bass is one of five instruments they play because it's all been digitized. So it's not the same. They don't pour the same amount of energy and passion into that one instrument. But I guess you could say probably the one good thing the artist has with digital technology is that they can go directly to an audience. They don't have to go through the gatekeeper of a record company. Because when I look back at your work, and you, you know, as you mentioned in the book, you know, the stuff you did, Electric Flag, Super Sessions, there was artistic freedom. You can mail rock, jazz, blues, and folk. Old generation thought, hey, maybe the kids will buy it. And looking now, 60 years later, we still listen to those records. High on my list, Horace Silver. When I want to really sense the music, I yeah. put on like Horace's stuff and it's just, it just grabs you. It's funky and, and it grabs you. If I come, you know, like I'll listen to Santana, old Santana sometimes. Sure. Uh, but I find I keep going back to the old jazz because that's, that's kind of what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new music that I like that I listen to, but I have no idea what it is. Like yeah. I'll put it on. And I, can, I don't really take it that seriously because it kind of all sounds the same to me. One of, one of two or three different progressions. I don't want to be that old fogey-ish, but I am. But, you know, I think part of that is due to streaming. So, for instance, when you hear, whether it be um, Songs for Your Father or Cape Verde and Blues, you know immediately who oh. that is. You know who it is. You put on Blue Train. You know exactly who that is. With a lot of the modern music, you're hearing so many influences, you can't be certain. Also, being that things are so confused now in, in, the, uh, in the world in general, in the global, you know, you want to get as much good stuff. You can't find good news on news programs. or any. So let's make some, some good music. And, uh, you know, I'm at the point now with the bass where, you know, I'm just finding, you know, I'm finding more and more reasons to write. The place I'm in now, I've got the book out. I've got the record, the album, or the project, whatever we call it at, at this point. And, <laughs> and I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for, you know, uh, other places to put my music. That's kind of it for me. I find that uh, the more I practice, which I still do, and I'm still learning the instrument. I'm, I'm working on uh, also playing uh, fretless. Ah, cause, okay. Because, you know, it didn't come on this one, but maybe in the future. And just having a wonderful family here in Jerusalem. I have a beautiful family, grandchildren, grandkids. I have an amazing wife. I'm blessed tremendously that way. And that in itself is a huge, important place to be in life. And I've been blessed to have the experiences that I have. And, and hopefully uh, it'll go on so I can see some of the grandkids and some of the great grandkids play some music too. I'm a very lucky guy that way. You know, you were talking about fretless. It's interesting to be in, in Israel. There are so many other influences, Arab, mu Arabian music, and all these uh -huh. other things. Uh, it really does lend itself to that fretless. Quarter tones, you know, and, and now the ability to play quarter tones and the Oriental scales, harmonic minor is a big one. But the things that I've learned, I've learned some things that I'm working on. A lot of the Arab music, they play these detailed lines, but all in unison. Oh, okay. All in unison, and it's like amazingly powerful. Oh, I bet. I love the Israeli music, you know, just a combination of uh, the Oriental and Arabic Moroccan sounds. And so, you know, this is a whole other thing. You know, I'm, I'm here being completely American. I'm an American in, in Israel. I'm, I'm now an Israeli American. And uh, I've been here for 11, 12 years. Best thing I ever did for me. And actually, under my wife's direction, she'd been coming here for years and years. I caught the Zionist part of it from her. It gives me the ability to be in another frame of mind. In America now, it's kind of all going around in circles. It's kind of hard to, to get outside of that. you know. And with the COVID, it's extremely, nobody knows what's happening. Okay, buddy. Okay, I get it. He says, you know, he's talked enough. 
<laughs> so, but in, 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 in San, I really appreciate talking to you guys and, and uh, talking about my book and Elegant Geezer Jerusalem Sessions. I uh, hope people out there, you know, go on, grab it, buy the book and tune, tune in with us on the uh, further adventures of uh, Harvey Brooks. And, and Atticus, we hear in the back. <laughs> Atticus. No, that was Godfrey who was just barking. Oh, was oh, that was barking of mine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably started off. There he goes. There he goes. So, Harvey, to wrap up, what uh, what Harvey tracks I would like to play all of uh, Super Sessions. I think that, to me, is the perfect bass album. Uh, you did that. Can you just, just add, I just want to know the synergy between all the people, you know, Mike and, and cool. Stephen Stills and Al. I, that record is just so damn smooth. I'm going to guess first takes, second takes on all the tracks? Oh, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, we did the whole album in two days. Some overdubbing that Al did in New York. Yeah. But basically, um, Michael's half of the album uh, was just Michael, Michael and Al, Al, you know, doing the songs he wanted to do, right? And Michael being Michael, and it just locked. Also, you know, we've been playing together. Sure, uh, that helps. But the but the idea was not letting it get too intellectual and just let it flow. Now, Al did a genius job on it because when, when Michael left, we, we had like, I don't know, three, four or five tracks. When when Michael left, Al was able to come up with the right guy and still uh, came in and still, it made it a great album. I think it made it a greater album than it would have been had Michael not left. It added a whole other character to it. You know, and Eddie Ho and myself, we were just kind of like, we had never played together. I walked in and I started tuning my bass and he started tuning his drums. The tuning just kind of locked in. So, you know, right away we were comfortable playing back and forth. The synergy of it was, was the excitement and the desire to make the shit happen and not beat it to death. It's easy in that circumstance to beat it to death because you, oh no, well this, this wasn't right here. That wasn't right there. Everybody was pretty on. I think that, that's kind of it. A season of the witch, classic. Yeah. Novel. Well, listen, you know, Allison Steele used to play that almost every night. <laughs> <laughs> to do the album was a lot of fun because it was painless. Except for the emotional. <laughs> speak the same language. Two months. We'll speak the same way, right, Atticus. We should put them on the. Uh, why listen to us? <laughs> Yeah, they have a lot more to talk about. He's talking super sessions. Come on, yeah, he really kind of looks like that. <laughs> it's been wonderful seeing you and speaking with you. Wonderful. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with some folks who uh, speak the same language. Absolutely. All right, Harvey. Be well. And regards right. to Bonnie. Uh, we'll do. It. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. I want to thank my co-host, Head Honcho of Know Your Bass Player, Tom Semioli, and of course the great Harvey Brooks. I hope you all enjoyed our show tonight. And next week we have another special show with the one and only Jim Fielder. Jim is known for his tenure with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and has played with everyone from Tim Buckley, the Mothers of Invention, Buffalo Springfield, Neil Sedaka, and many more. You don't want to miss this one. 8 p.m next Monday on CygnusRadio.com. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening. Take care. 